Hello there. My name is Will Watson, and I'll be doing the 2023 September-October Public Forum debate video, Resolve the United States Federal Government Should Substantially Increase Its Military Presence in the Arctic. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet, uh, I recommend that you subscribe to Champion Briefs to get more of these topic analysis videos. Additionally, look out for Champion Briefs uh, monthly, or in this case, bi-monthly brief uh, regarding the public forum topic to get a better understanding of what other people are running and to get some prep that you can make your own. Uh, today we're going to do a couple things. Uh, we're going to start out by giving some background on uh, Russia, the United States, and the Arctic competition. Then we're going to move into pro and con arguments before finally concluding and looking at the whole topic and uh, what I believe rounds will look like at the end of the day. A uh, quick note about me. My background is I got my master's in international affairs from the Bush School of Government Public Service with a focus on intel, grant strategy, and defense policy. I did my undergraduate at Texas A&M University where I focused on Russia of all things. Uh, specifically, I looked at Baltic countries and I got my minor in Russian with my major being international studies. Um, so I'm really excited to have the wonderful opportunity to speak to y'all on an issue that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Russia, the Arctic, and the United States military. Um, so let's start with some background. Um, most of y'all have gone to camp this past summer, or maybe you had teammates who went to camp. So I'd really like to keep this background at what's happened likely since you got back from camp, because you're always able to sync up with some of your camp buddies or sync up with some of the other debaters. Um, so I'm going to try to keep the arguments a little more than what you probably have already heard. That way everyone's getting some value added out of this. Um, in the past couple of weeks, Russia has escalated its military activity in the Arctic with Russia and China in early August holding a bi holding bilateral military exercises uh, up in north uh, the excuse me the North Pacific, uh, specifically near Alaska. The U.S. sent four destroyers to intercept it. Um, I read about it in the South China Morning Post, which called the U.S. activity, I believe, uh, provocative, or just said that the U.S. has responded to China and Russia. Um, this is emblematic of a lot of the competition we're seeing in the Arctic. Not necessarily missiles being sh fired, guns being shot, but rather a, a, a variation of the Cold War, where there's pursuit, push, recall, push, recall. Um, I, I, and that defined Arctic competition for a long time. During the Cold War, the U.S. and Russia, along with U.S. allies, maintained a significant military presence in the Arctic. After the Cold War, the U.S. wound down its military presence in the Arctic, primarily because Russia wasn't perceived as a threat. Now, it's very debatable whether or not Russia should still be perceived as a threat to the United States. However, Russia has maintained their military presence in the Arctic, expanding bases. Uh, the U.S., on the other hand, and its allies haven't done that exactly. Uh, Canada still only spends 1.3% of its GDP on defense, despite the NATO 2% rule. Additionally, our bases in the Arctic are concentrated in two areas. Uh, first is Thule, Greenland, where we hold our northernmost base um, in Greenland. Uh, but additionally, we are currently working on a deep water port in Nome, Alaska, uh, which will support additional Arctic activities. To an extent, we already are affirming in the status quo. We are pursuing an increase in military presence in the Arctic through the Nome base. However, should we be doing so? And what would a substantial increase look like? I think it's worth mentioning here icebreakers. The U.S. has either, uh, I believe, three operational icebreakers right now. Um, and its allies aren't in much better of a shape with uh, Finland uh, and Denmark having uh, other icebreakers. Russia, on the other hand, maintains and operates a very substantial icebreaker fleet. So we're getting outclassed a lot in the Arctic. And I don't think that that area is up for a lot of debate. For me to say that we are getting outclassed in the Arctic is a pretty easy conclusion to reach. The more difficult question and the topic that this debate topic mandates is, does it matter? Is it impactful? Should we accept that we may not have the Arctic in a full-out war? Or should we um, fight for it? And so I think that brings us into some pro and con arguments here. Before I go any further, it's important to mention that the Ukraine conflict, Russian activities, Chinese activities have prompted a new storm where you are constantly having new evidence generated every single day. 
that can feel overwhelming if you wait to the last minute to prep. So one, no procrastination. No one's allowed to procrastinate on this topic because if you do, your opponents are going to out prep you. But second, a useful tool that I would use is uh, Google Alerts. Google Alerts allow you to set up a Boolean search function that will give you a daily or weekly news brief of everything going on. I think that that's an extremely useful tool that you should make use of on most topics, but especially a topic like this where there's so many dynamic pieces. Uh, for example, two days ago there was a really great article in Foreign Policy uh, by Alexander Gray talking about why NATO's northern flank has too many weak spots, which brings us pretty nicely into the pro. Uh, because the pro's argument is deterrence. How do we get Russia out of the Arctic? How do we prevent them from expanding in the Arctic? And how do we pre prevent them from getting into a conflict with the United States? If the pro can successfully answer these questions, they'll be on a pretty solid path. The nature of the pro is specificity. What is a substantial increase in U.S. military presence in the Arctic? Well, I think there are some easy answers and some harder answers and some actual answers. Uh, some of the easy answers would be an increase in U.S. military bases in the Arctic, uh, literally physically expanding our military presence in the Arctic. Um, then there have been arguments that we would increase our naval presence in the Arctic, maybe by contesting uh, Russian trade in the Arctic, or rather their perceived uh, exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, um, using freedom of navigation exercises, or FONOPs which is where the Navy sends a ship with some really big guns through a route that another country has contested. We've done so in the South China Sea, where we have sailed our vessels through the South China Sea, um, and China said, you're entering our territory illegally. We say it's international water. They say you're in our territory. We say it's international water using pre-recorded diplomatic scripts and back and forth, back and forth. But the more important thing is it's really hard to turn around a U.S. destroyer. They're big ships with big guns and crew that constantly works very hard to ensure our national security. And sh making sure that we are able to successfully conduct a free navigation exercise is paramount before actually doing it. Saying that the pro would make for an effective phone op it could be a, a viable affirmative. Now, these are two physical things we could do in the Arctic. Um, Let's talk about some of the less physical things, such as increasing our software. Um, would a substantial increase be substantially increasing uh, some of our military assets, like our telecommunication cables that may run in the North Sea and the Arctic, uh, increasing our software at pre-existing bases, increasing our footprint in ways that aren't as traditional? These are questions the pros should answer. And I recommend pulling from legislative text. Uh, President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's writings on the subject, if there are writings, dig into that, um, and trying to uncover what the most likely scenario of implementation would be, because there's three ways to do the implementation debate in public forum. Uh, first is fairness. What implementation scenario gives both sides the most ground and produces a fair debate? Second is education. Which pursuit gives us the most educational debate. Because if I was to say that we should increase our military presence, or substantially increase our military presence in the Arctic by having it where uh, the military builds a, uh, builds a giant golf course in the Arctic, that may technically be true, that that would be topical. But it's not educational. There's not a lot of gain other than finding out what someone's handicap is. So it's better to talk about things that are more real world, which brings me to the third way to discuss the implementation, which is by impacting to real world. Finding something that's already existing and is the most likely scenario for implementation is an effective way of saying, hey, if the resolution was just presented to um, our political leaders, they would interpret it this way. Therefore, this is most likely to happen. So some different ways to go about this. But to go back onto the pro side, there's another argument for the pro that we should go ahead and get some resources out of the Arctic. But a good way to do that is to secure them with the military first. Uh, U.S. businesses don't like going into areas where they are likely to get kicked out of. That's a high risk investment. And that's something that's difficult to ju uh, justify. 
but with the U.S. military patrolling the waters and ensuring their security and making sure that they're able to go in and rescue them if it gets really bad, we may be able to extract resources. Now, there's uh, four primary resources people look for in the Arctic. First is rare earth elements, REEs, also called rare earth minerals. These are very heavy elements, metals, that are used in most of our modern electronics from the computer or TV or iPhone or Nook that you're watching this on uh, to um, things like F-35s and solar panels and wind turbines. You get access to technology, both defense and commercial, along with green technology from rare earth elements and the Arctic has them. That's important and can impact out the debate. The second thing that the Arctic has uh, is oil and natural gas, your hydrocarbons. There's a lot of them in the Arctic. Uh, and there's the idea that we should extract them from the Arctic for uh, commercial benefit. Decreasing fuel costs doesn't just help uh, individuals in the oil industry. It also it trickles down throughout the economy, and here's why. If it costs me a dollar to transport something from point A to point B, that dollar's passed on to the customer by the price of the food. If it costs me two dollars, now all of a sudden the price of transport doubled, that's gonna increase the price. If we increase transport prices, it increases the price of everything else because everything has to be transported. So by reducing fuel costs, we're able to reduce prices. That helps people, and it especially helps people who currently have difficulties affording food. So increased oil can, incre can impact out uh, to people in low-income situations. Uh, next thing that's in the Arctic are fish. There's a lot of fish in the Arctic, and some people say that we should secure the Arctic in order to increase access to fish so that people can have more food. Uh, finally, there are trade routes in the Arctic. As I said before, getting from point A to point B costs money. By going through the Arctic, we may be able to reduce that amount of time. However, Russia has contested most of the trade routes and has claimed that they're within its territory. That means that there would have to be um, a U.S. military operation or a very, very brave and successful commercial venture or a combination of icebreakers to make the trade routes possible, or more likely a scenario where you see all three of these happening in order to secure trade routes in the Arctic. So we can deter Russia and we can get stuff. Are there two core pro tenets? Um, year round in the pro is unlikely to be substantially more diverse than this, except that you don't just get to deter Russia. You also get to deter China, because China considers itself a near Arctic presence. Now, there are eight countries adjacent to the Arctic. Uh, I call them Finn Cutters, to help me remember it. It is Finland, Iceland, Norway, Canada, the United States, Russia, Denmark, and Sweden. Finn Cutters. Help, help me with a debate camp. Now, you may have noticed China is not in the Arctic. And if you look at a map, you'll see China is not in the Arctic. And if you ask uh, any student in elementary level geography, China is not in the Arctic. But China considers itself a near Arctic presence. And that's because China wants the rare earth elements and they want the oil in the Arctic and they want to be able to lay claim to a lot of the assets in the Arctic. Also, it's worth noting the Arctic is a really easy way to launch a missile from point A to point B if point A is the United States and point B is Russia or vice versa. It's a pretty up down versus trying to traverse the globe. There are military implications to the Arctic. There's China implications to the Arctic. You get to talk about a lot of international relations threats on this topic. But we spent a little bit of time on the pro. Let's switch over to the con. The first thing, if any, if in any debate you hear the pro claim deterrence, that means the con has a link to escalation. Because if we're trying to deter someone, we could accidentally aggravate them and escalate the scenario. Pro gets deterrence, con gets escalation. We make the scenario with Russia worse, the scenario with China worse, and push them into a point where they would attack us. That gives the con a war impact, which I've seen most of the time boil out to a wash, but I'll explain at the end where it can't. Um, another thing most cons are talking about is the environmental impact. There are those who argue that U.S. military is bad for the environment, and those who argue that U.S. military bases produce environmental waste. There's also evidence out there that if we drill for oil, we may spill oil. If we drill for REs, there may be environmental impacts. 
going ahead and impacting to the environment, I think could be really effective on this topic. I would caution teams away from increasing straight to global warming, and here's why. We are increasing our military presence in one area of the world. That area has heavy impacts from global warming, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a 1% increase in contribution there is a 10% contribution around the world. Instead, it's still a 1% contribution. Now, teams will say that their impact is scalar, that, oh, we increase it, X more people die. Listen closely to their evidence, because they're probably reading really big statistics about the totality of the impact of global warming, rather than making it specific to this scenario. So call, call for that evidence. I prefer looking at some of these smaller, but more likely uh, global, or excuse me, environmental scenarios. Uh, look at air pollution look at water pollution, find the source point pollution. Uh, the second thing that a lot of cons, or excuse me, the third thing a lot of cons are really talking about are indigenous people and the impact uh, the U.S. military um, may have on the indigenous community in the Arctic and impacting out often to structural violence. I, I think that a lot of cons are going to pull this, probably not as many at camp though. And those of you who went to camp likely heard this argument a hundred times. Not every judge is as well versed at, at an actual debate tournament as debate uh, camp counselors are. So I don't think it's going to work as well on local circuits as it likely worked at your debate camp. But now's a great time to learn how to debate things like structural violence. If I'm going to tell you that there will be an impact to a community um, and that impact will multiply itself versus we may be able to start, uh, we may be able to stop a war, which one outweighs? These are hard questions, and these are questions that debaters should be asking in round. Um, those are going to be your bread and butter on the con. But let's go into what it will look like in round, just based on my assumption. I think you're going to have half rounds that could be decided on paper. Those will be your deterrence versus escalation rounds. The, what it's going to come down to is who wins the uniqueness debate, not the link debate. Because if the pro can win that a war is coming right now, that makes it try or die for the pro. Um, and if the con can win that a war is not coming right now, um, then it makes it where the pro has nothing to solve for. By questioning the uniqueness, you'll be able to control the direction of the link pretty effectively in these rounds. But of course, do the link analysis too. Um, I think your other half of rounds are going to be squirrelier. This may, these may be the rounds where you have to get really deep into structural violence and really understand the nuances of consequentialism. Um, and not just that. It may be that you get really deep into military theory. Uh, what tools does the US have in its US military toolbox? Because it's a big toolbox with a lot of people very dedicated to service. Uh, so I think that you will get into some of the hey, here's how many destroyers, here's what the armament package would be in this topic. If you're ever going to get into it, it would be on this topic. Um, with those rounds, it's kind of come down to probability uh, and understanding. Who knows more about the topic? Which team? Uh, I've always said that whoever knows the most will win the round, whether that's knowing the most about the judge or the topic or how to speak. If you know the most about the topic for this one, you're going to have a huge advantage. So I'd advise debaters not to read for arguments, read to read on this topic and read to become as much of an Arctic subject matter expert as you can. It will pay off dividends in your rounds. So that concludes today's video. Uh, I did want to give a special shout out to anyone who's just starting their debate career or maybe just starting their competitive season. Welcome this activity. This is a phenomenal activity that pays off dividends throughout life. I know that I wouldn't be where I am today without speech and debate, and I think there's a lot of people who can say the same. Um, so I, I've also used a lot of jargon in this video, and I'm aware that I did that. I did that intentionally. That's so that you will go and ask your varsity and go and Google what a lot of these words I just threw out to you high school freshmen or middle schoolers or anyone who's watching this. It's time to take your debate to the next level and start really learning as you go through your argumentation. Anyways, everyone, please have a wonderful competitive season. Uh, stay safe. Have fun. Take care. Um, I'll see you all uh, for the next video.